Welcome to the Macmillan Report. I'm Marilyn Wilkes, your host, and our guest is Eckert Fromm, a professor of Assyriology at Yale. His main research interests are Assyrian and Babylonian history and Mesopotamian scholarly texts of the first millennium BCE. His courses at Yale include topics in Mesopotamian history, religion and literature, and the Bible in its ancient Near Eastern setting. Professor Fromm has authored several books, including Babylonian and Assyrian text commentaries, Origins of Interpretation. He is currently in the process of, of creating an online portal that provides key information and full editions of these commentaries. Today we talk with Professor Fromm about the psychohistory of an Assyrian king. Welcome, Professor Fromm. Thank you very much, and thank you for the invitation. Of course. So, how did you become interested in Assyriology? Well, perhaps I should first start explaining a little bit what Assyriology actually is. That would be many great. People actually, sort of mix Have it up. Have no with, idea. Or mix it up with even worse with astrology or so. Mm -hmm. But in fact, Assyriology is a scholarly discipline that explores the ancient Near East that deals with the, the languages, the cultures, and history of ancient Iraq, uh, ancient Syria, and to a certain extent also ancient Iran and ancient Turkey. Um, it uh, is particularly focused on texts, of which there are many. There are some several hundreds of thousands of, of uh, ancient documents written in cuneiform in various and, languages. And can I ask you, sure. are they, uh, is, it's not paper, is it? Is it some other substance? No. Uh, the um, ancient Mesopotamians actually wrote on clay, and that is very fortunate for us, because unlike a library, like with, with books, when it, when it burns down, everything is lost. Mm -hmm. Clay, when it is being fired, actually gets even harder and is almost indestructible. And that is the reason why we have so many documents from the ancient Near East. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that is very curious to me because I would imagine they're, are they very heavy? They can be often enough. Um, the tablets are broken when they are found and uh, so we have to reassemble them. Mm -hmm. We call that joining. Uh, but of course, they are heavier than, let's say, uh, a book or a scroll. Um, and so, for instance, letter writing meant that uh, the scribes would write in very, very uh, small script on the clay in order to make sure that the transport of, of these documents would be fairly easy. And Yale, um, I understand Yale has a very fine collection. It does. In fact, the Yale Babylonian collection is uh, the largest collection of cuneiform texts in the United States. Wow. It has some 35,000 documents, which is a substantial number. And these are all um, clay tablets? These are essentially all clay tablets. We wow. also have a number of seals, some of which inscribed. But primarily, these are tablets, mm -hmm. representing all sorts of texts from literature and religious texts to everyday documents, such as letters, mm -hmm. uh, legal deeds. Um, uh, and so on. So there's hardly anything that is not represented mm -hmm. uh, in the Babylonian collection here. Very interesting. So um, what led you to um, study? Yeah, I mean, I was of course not aware uh, of the richness of this field when I was a child, mm -hmm. and uh, it was not my intention when I was, let's say, 10, 10 years old to mm -hmm. become an archaeologist. I actually wanted to become a sp sportscaster at that okay. time, but on the radio, not on television. <laughs> um, so uh, this isn't really my natural environment. But then uh, when in high school, I had the opportunity to study Hebrew, Biblical Hebrew, out of curiosity, I didn't want to become a minister or anything. Sure. But uh, I realized when reading the Hebrew Bible uh, that there were all these stories about the ancient Babylonians and Assyrians, about their kings, um, about the downfall of Assyria and Babylonia, and so on. And that intrigued me. And uh, by studying Hebrew, you also study a Semitic language. Um, and the main language of ancient Mesopotamia, Akkadian, is likewise Semitic, so it is related to Hebrew. So I became a little bit interested in that. Mm -hmm. And Akkadian is a language very well um, documented in the records. Um, we have some, well, probably more than half a million of texts in Akkadian alone. Um, so we have probably more texts in Akkadian from the ancient world than in Latin. Only Greek has a larger uh, number of texts. Um, and that was another thing. I realized that there's still a lot to be done. Most of these texts actually are not yet published. And I found it challenging to do that and kind of exciting. I also traveled a little bit in the region. I went to Turkey, Eastern Turkey, and to Syria and saw some of the sites. And so that was eventually what motivated me to, to get into this, mm -hmm. this field, which seems small and obscure, but um, the texts document a period uh, reaching from 
the mid-fourth millennium down to the time of Christ. So it's essentially the first half of history. So I would claim it's not quite as marginal as it might seem at, mm -hmm. at first. Right. And yeah. do these texts span a wide range of topics? Um, for instance, are there any kind of, um, besides the deeds and legal forms, are there any other kinds of texts that they would have written? There definitely are, and I mentioned literary texts, so the okay. earliest literature actually is from ancient Mesopotamia. These are epics and myths, but for oh, instance, okay. we also have, we have humoristic compositions, mm -hmm. so they have a certain sense of humor. Uh, we have many scholarly texts, so the beginning of mathematics and ancient mm -hmm. philology are not with the ancient Greeks, even though I do not want to deny that the Greeks created something that wasn't many of us knew. Sure. But the earliest philology, the earliest mathematics, this is all ancient Mesopotamia, so oh, uh, the theorem of Pythagoras, for instance, is not something the Greeks came up <laughs> with. It is attested in the, in the 18th century BC in Mesopotamia already. Ah, very interesting. All right, so let's talk about your paper, Family Matters, uh, the Psychohistorical Reflections on Sennacherib. Am I saying that correctly? Sennacherib, but okay. it's okay. And his times. So tell us about the paper and who that um, Assyrian king was. Sure. Um, Sennacherib is actually the, the Hebrew Bible version of that very name. Uh, in Assyrian, his name was Sin Ahereba. So Sennacherib was an Assyrian king who ruled from 705 to 681 BCE. Uh, he ruled during an important period. Um, this was the time when, perhaps for the first time in human history, um, there was such a thing as an empire. Now it can be debated what really constitutes an empire. There is no uh, consensus whether the Assyrians really were the first ones to have one. Mm -hmm. But what they did have was a, a state of massive size, ranging essentially from the Armenian highlands in the north down to the Persian Gulf in the south and from the Zagros Mountains in Iran to the Levant and even down to Egypt. It was also a multi-ethnic and multilingual uh, empire with many different people being represented. It was well organized uh, in, in provinces and there was a kind of osmotic flow of, of uh, taxes and, and tribute from the periphery to the center. It was ruled in a very centralist way with one king in charge who of course relied on a well-equipped um, military uh, and a well-educated administration. And, and all that sort of uh, is what, what I would say uh, it was, was the blueprint for all the later empires in mm -hmm. uh, the ancient Near East, starting with the Babylonians and the Persians, but even down to the, to the, Aba to the Islamic states of the Abbasids and the Ottomans. Mm -hmm. This, I think, is what gives the Assyrian Empire sort of uh, an important place in world history. Um, it's also, I mean, should add that perhaps the place in which uh, the, the Israelites and the Judeans developed their, their monotheistic uh, ideas, and mm -hmm. that certainly happened in, to some extent in response to the experience of a monocratic king, namely the Assyrian king. Mm -hmm. So that had an impact as well. Um, so Sennacherib ruled this large empire uh, towards the end of the 8th and the beginning of the 7th century BCE. Some of his sort of key uh, uh, achievements uh, militarily and politically were uh, his... Uh, um, a campaign against the Levant, uh, famous among other things through a report in the Bible about this campaign and his attack on Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. uh, he managed in the end to uh, become the master of this region. Um, and um, at the same time, his uh, conflict with Babylonia uh, in 689, he actually destroyed the city of Babylon, an event uh, that had some long term consequences and mm -hmm. was of, of great significance. But he also uh, sort of was active in more constructive ways. Um, he is the king who um, turned the city of Nineveh, also famous from the Bible and also known from Greek sources, into the, the greatest metropolis of his age uh, with a 12 kilometer long wall surrounding it, massive palaces and temples inside. He so was very um, interested in um, architecture. He was indeed yeah. very interested in architecture. He had already, while crown prince, been engaged in the building activities of his father, Sargon II. Uh, and he also, um, that's another interesting aspect about him, uh, built uh, a number of, of, of canals and aqueducts uh, to make sure that uh, the agricultural production around Nineveh and in Syria in general mm -hmm. would, would grow. So this was another rather sort of impressive achievement um, of his reign. And he describes it at great length in his texts, which does indeed, as you say, indicate 
that this was, um, I wouldn't call it a hobby, but something that he mm -hmm. really was uh, very interested right. in. So let's talk a little bit about the psychohistorical um, aspects of him. Tell us a little bit about uh, the insights that you've come up with in terms of the research that you've done and why um, it, it really is kind of a departure to look at the, uh, like a psychoanalysis of him um, versus, ver versus the other impacts that he's had. Sure. Perhaps I should first say that psychohistory actually has a very bad name among uh, contemporary, serious contemporary historians. Mm -hmm. I think Eleanor Roosevelt once said that great minds discuss ideas, average minds discuss events, and small minds discuss people. And that is essentially, that essentially epitomizes what many, many historians today believe, only that they would not claim that it is so much ideas that determine history, but rather systems or structures, economic institutions, religious ideologies, and so on, all these abstract forces. Now, I am, of course, absolutely uh, fine with, with, with the idea that all these mm -hmm. things are important. I would not deny that. But that said, I also do believe that uh, personal individual whims that, that, mm -hmm. uh, of, of individual historical actors, that um, their experiences in their family lives and what, what kind of trauma also came out of that, likewise did have an effect on the unfolding of history. Of course, especially since he controlled virtually everything that was going on. Indeed. I mean, that is, of course, something that applies specifically to a situation where you have one uh, ruler who is, who is really very much in charge mm -hmm. of things. So in this case, um, the, uh, the, the psychological infrastructure of that very ruler, I think, really does matter. Mm -hmm. The experiences of his youth or uh, his later life with his parents, his siblings, his, 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 his wives or husbands, all that, I think, really does matter and does shape to some extent the politics mm -hmm. of that very uh, individual. So this is in a way my premise. Now of course I'm well, well aware of the, of, of the methodological problems of, of retroactive psychoanalysis. Mm -hmm. um, it is really hard to know exactly what was going indeed, on Indeed, I mean we're, we're dealing here with individuals mm -hmm. who lived more than 2,500 years ago. Um, I'm also most definitely not an orthodox Freudian or so. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm applying um, psychology in a very loose way. Mm -hmm. But what I do try to establish in this paper is um, whether I, uh, one can show that certain um, sort of events from Sennacherib's family life uh, did not perhaps um, have an impact on, on the way he ruled Assyria and um, his politics in general. Mm -hmm. And one matter that stands out here, I would say, is his relationship with his father, okay. whose name I mentioned, mm -hmm. um, Sargon II, a very powerful king in his own right, uh, a great military man, with whom Sennacherib originally seems to have had a pretty good relationship. Um, mm -hmm. He was his crown prince from early on. Sennacherib um, represented his father while his father spent three years in Babylon. Uh, he received um, well, the tribute bringers from all over the empire. He was uh, engaged in, in collecting military in intelligence. We have letters from this time, so we get a lot of information about his political formation from these letters. Mm -hmm. uh, we also learned a little bit about his private life from them. All this seems pretty okay. But then there are a few things where we can see that there's a growing rift be between Mr. Nakab and his father. One is that uh, Sargon, Nakab's father, marries another woman, makes her um, his new queen. Sennacherib was probably afraid that perhaps if that woman, woman had, a, had, a, had a child, um, that child might become crown prince mm -hmm. in his stead. Uh, and did she have a child? She, she probably did, um, yeah, it looks like it. Um, and Sennacherib was also not happy with um, Sargon's Babylonian politics. There was a very special relationship between Babylonia and Assyria. It was a little bit like between the Greeks and the Romans. The Assyrians, in a way, represent the Romans here. So they wanted to rule Babylonia, but they acknowledged that Babylonia was the source of, of culture and civilization and religion. Mm -hmm. And that is the case. The Assyrians got much of their literature, their religion, and so on from Babylonia. And Sargon was very pro-Babylonian. He wanted to rule Babylonia, but he um, was also willing to give Babylonia a lot of privileges, tax exemptions, etc., and he spent these three years there. Mm -hmm. And that, it seems, was not something Sennacherib approved of. But what really caused an almost traumatic shift in his relationship to his father was the death of his father, mm -hmm. which occurred in 705 BCE when Sargon went on a campaign to Anatolia in which he was killed um, by um, 
local insurgents. And what was even worse was that his body could not be recovered. He couldn't be buried. And that was very bad in Syria. There must have been a great fear that for, henceforth his, his, his ghost would haunt the living. We have, for instance, evidence that one of the most important uh, Syrian scholars immediately after the news of Sargon's death reached um, Syria um, copied um, the 12th tablet of the Gilgamesh epic, of the most famous literary text from ancient Mesopotamia, um, at the end of which we, we, we have a discussion between Enkidu um, and Gilgamesh, the two protagonists, about mm -hmm. what happens to someone who dies in enemy country and cannot be buried, and it's very bad. Mm -hmm. So this man, this scholar, was clearly concerned about that. Right. There's also a text um, in which um, Sennacherib investigates the nature of the sin of Sargon that led to his death. In the ancient Near East, there was this belief that um, when something terrible happens to you, you must have caused it in some way and mm -hmm. thereby have kind of attracted the, the, the rage of the gods. Another form of karma. In a way, yeah, <laughs> in, indeed, yes, you could say so. Mm -hmm. So nothing happens without a reason. And it is very clear that um, from that moment onwards, and from the moment of, of Sargon's death, when Sennacherib became king, he distanced himself very much from his father. Sargon had built a massive new capital himself um, and had inaugurated it just one year before his death. But Sennacherib just simply leaves this massive new city and moves to Nineveh. He does not want to dwell there anymore. He builds a temple for the netherworld god that certainly is also in response to the death of his father, mm -hmm. but never mentions the real reason, namely Sargon's death. He hides some of the reliefs that Sargon created uh, at the religious capital of, of Assyria, Ashur. Um, and most importantly, he never mentions his father in his inscriptions. Mm -hmm. He imitates these inscriptions occasionally, um, but um, so his relationship was somewhat ambivalent, but he clearly does not follow Sargon's politics. Uh, this is most obvious with respect to Babylonia. There we can see that unlike Sargon who privileged Babylonia, Sennacherib does not want to do that. He doesn't even want to be king of Babylonia. Mm -hmm. So instead what he does, he um, puts a local Babylonian um, um, up as a Babylonian king as a, as a puppet ruler. Mm -hmm. Later on when that doesn't work out, he makes one of his sons the king of Babylon. And why, did not, why didn't he want to be the king of Babylonia? Because his father had favored them? I think so. I think it would have meant that uh, he would have sort of provided the message that yes, the Assyrians favored the Babylonians more than anyone else, and that was something apparently Sennacherib didn't want to do. I see. So he wanted a more indirect way mm -hmm. of, of, of um, controlling Babylonia. Okay. And he was apparently also, yeah, I mean, his relationship to Babylonian culture was, was ambivalent, but, but he was probably to some extent more of an Assyrian nationalist than his father was, even though, of course, the term nationalism is, is kind of um, anachronistic. Mm -hmm. In the end, the Babylonians killed Sennacherib's son um, in 694, who was their king. And that must have enraged uh, Sennacherib even more. So here we have another case where, well, what is essentially a personal event leads to to future political action, in this case, the uh, complete destruction of Babylon, mm -hmm. which is an event that happened in 689. And that year, Sennacherib, and that was really quite, quite uh, unprecedented. It was as though, as if the Romans had destroyed Athens. Uh, Sennacherib decided to completely uh, destroy the city, and, and he did and that. He did. And this, again, had long-term consequences, because the Babylonians never forgot what Sennacherib had done. They remembered in it in, in their textual record um, centuries after uh, they were still aware of uh, this event. And uh, it stands to reason that when the Babylonians, together with the Medes in 614 and 612, destroyed the Assyrian cities of Ashur and Nineveh, uh, that they did this in, in revenge for the previous destruction of their own city by Sennacherib. Mm -hmm. So, of course, Sennacherib had all sorts of reasons to act the way he did against Babylonia, but I do think that these personal ones did play a role. And I would argue that you can see here a, sort of a chain of events that may either originally have been rooted in, in personal feelings, becoming then eventually sort of a, a spectacle on the, on the world historical um, stage. Right, right. Okay. Very interesting. And in terms of the methodology, you, you basically glean this from the research that you've done, the reading of these texts. Yes, essentially uh, I do. Um, 
I have actually studied uh, Assyrian royal inscriptions for a long time, and mm -hmm. those of Sennacherib especially. Mm -hmm. uh, and the sources are rich. There are some 600 inscribed objects with texts written in the name of Sennacherib mm -hmm. alone, presenting some 200 different texts. I already mentioned they wrote on clay, and often enough these, these inscriptions, which can be very long, mm -hmm. some are, have some 1,000 lines, mm -hmm. um, but they're often broken. So one of the challenges is to just simply piece them together. Right. What you do is you go to the museums where these uh, inscriptions are housed. Um, most important uh, with respect to the Assyrians is the British Museum, but there's also, for instance, Chicago. And then you, you, you try to identify duplicates. You try to join texts. Mm -hmm. When you're very fortunate, you actually manage to make transatlantic joins. I once managed to uh, join a couple of fragments uh, kept in the Chicago Oriental Institute with fragments kept in London that somehow got there independently. Mm -hmm. So these, of course, are... Wow, that uh, must have been very exciting. Yeah, these, these are yeah. exciting moments mm -hmm. when you are a scholar, yeah. that is true. But in the end, the goal, of course, is to, to get a good idea of what Sennacherib actually wrote down. Now, these are not, strictly speaking, autobiographies, even though they're written in the name of the king. Um, and uh, the king is the only real protagonist. But they were written, we know that as well, uh, by, by ghostwriters, so to speak, mm -hmm. um, who, who uh, however, consulted the king. We have letters in which these ghostwriters um, asked the king to provide some um, information on what he wanted to have covered in these inscriptions. So we can assume that they do really, to some extent at least, uh, represent the, uh, the vision of the king himself. Mm -hmm. We also have other texts, um, for instance, letters or so, um, which of course I mentioned the ones from Sennacherib's time as a crown prince, mm -hmm. which are less sort of ideological char ideologically charged. As you can imagine, the royal inscriptions present uh, a very king-centered image sure. of world history. The letters deal with real problems. There's no time for ideological bombast. They really need to address the actual problems. Mm -hmm. And we also have a couple of, of uh, chronicles, which are likewise fairly objective, give us a good chronological skeleton of the events happening, and sometimes refer to events that were not so great for, let's say, the Assyrians. And so altogether, I do believe we have a fairly substantial number of sources. Mm -hmm. We also are lucky that Sennacherib actually mentioned some of these um, um, family-related aspects of his life in his inscriptions. That is quite unusual. He does mention especially several of his wives um, to such an extent that a scholar actually has asked somewhat rhetorically the question, was Sennacherib a feminist? Uh -huh. And that certainly goes too far, and I think no modern feminist would actually subscribe to that idea. But it is true that we have a lot of information on these women. And they played an important role as well, especially when it came to Sennacherib's succession. Mm -hmm. Sennacherib had two main wives who served as queens. There, you know, he also had a, a number of harems in various cities, like all the Syrian kings. Mm -hmm. But these kings had uh, usually one or occasionally more than one main wife who served uh, in an official capacity as a Syrian queen. And it seems that the one uh, who, who, uh, whose sons were originally meant to succeed Sennacherib at some point was sidelined by a second wife, uh, Narkia, and it was the son of that second wife who eventually became the next Assyrian king. Mm -hmm. It is interesting, in fact, to, uh, this is another case where I think one can apply, in a way, the idea of psychohistory. It's interesting to see that um, under Sennacherib, the Assyrian state god, Ashur, suddenly has two wives as well, two divine spouses. Mm -hmm. One of them is named Molissu, and the other one is Shehua. And I can't prove it, but it seems tempting to me that, in a way, Sennacherib is projecting his own kind of family life onto the divine sphere. Mm -hmm. um, just as he had these two main wives, his god had to have these two wives mm -hmm. as well. So what happened to Sennacherib? Eventually, um, while all his attempts to sort of distance himself from his father, perhaps to be protected and not to uh, suffer the same fate, fate that his father had, has, had suffered, actually failed. Uh, because uh, due to the, um, to the conflicts about his succession, um, the elder sons, one of whom had been crown prince uh, initially and had been eventually um, replaced by this uh, son of the other woman, this elder son actually conspired against Sennacherib. Mm -hmm. Sennacherib had sent this new crown prince to the west in order that it seems to protect him from attacks of his elder brothers. It was a little bit like in a Shakespearean drama, mm -hmm. in fact. 
Um, but he didn't change his mind about the succession, and that prompted this um, elder son of his, the former crown prince, to murder him. Uh -huh. uh, and so in 681, um, he was killed by this, by this man. Um, we have reference to this murder um, in um, a Babylonian chronicle, in an Assyrian letter, and even in the Hebrew Bible. Do you this know how he was killed? Well, um, it, is, it is not entirely clear. My own take in it, using several sources, is that he was probably killed with a sword while entering a temple um, at Nineveh. Mm -hmm. um, but so not poisoned. <laughs> no, he, he was uh, probably not poisoned, but we cannot be entirely sure about mm -hmm. that. The Bible okay. claims he was killed with a sword, but that may be uh, actually a topos. So um, we have no Assyrian or Babylonian source that would ex exactly say how he was killed. Right. But one te text intriguingly says that he was killed between uh, bull colossi. You may have seen in in, in, in the Metropolitan Museum, these massive stone colossi that guarded the entrances of Assyrian palaces and temples. And so the question here is, was he just standing between the colossi when he was killed, or were these colossi in some ways thrown over him, which mm -hmm. is what some scholars believe. I think that's unlikely if you realize how big these things heavy, are. yes. So it's a nice idea, but I'm afraid right, it's probably right. not correct. Okay, mm. so I would imagine that um, some of the these texts have made its way into the, the portal that you're working on and of course the publication. So let's talk about that a little bit. Tell us about the project. Yeah, uh, the project I'm engaged in right now is not related in any way directly to politics. Mm -hmm. It is sort of rather sort of intellectual history. Uh, ancient Mesopotamia is the place where for the first time in human history you have text commentaries. So towards the end of the second millennium Mesopotamian scholars began to serialize and canonize their scholarly traditions, divinity texts, medical texts, literary texts, and others. These texts from then on could no longer be changed. It was no longer really possible to, to edit them, just like, well, the Bible can no longer be changed. Um, that led to a need among the scholars to comment on these texts in order to make sure that they would remain accessible. Oh, okay. Because, well, I mean, uh, these texts remained in, in place for, for roughly 1,000 years, mm -hmm. and they became, to some extent, of course, difficult to understand. So um, in the first half of the first millennium BCE, we, we see the production in Mesopotamia, both in Assyria and in the south, in Babylonia, of hundreds of commentary texts. In a way, a sort of first Babylonian Talmud, some of which simply explain, let's say, um, the names of plants in medical texts, mm -hmm. explaining what these plants actually are, describing them also. Others, uh, more sophisticated, uh, trying to establish additional layers of meaning, um, kind of an esoteric interpretation of this tradition. Um, these texts have never been collected in any way, and many actually remain unpublished. And the project I'm engaged in uh, right now, together with a postdoc, Enrique Jimenez from Spain, who is here at Yale right now, is to gather them, to um, edit them, to provide introductions to them. These texts are very difficult. Mm -hmm. um, they are among the most difficult texts um, available from Mesopotamia. And to make the editions plus photos and introductions um, available online, um, we hope that we will get an additional grant. Right now I'm able to I have some money to pay um, my postdoc. Mm -hmm. But it is a fairly massive project given the fact that there are almost 1,000 of these commentaries. Wow. So it will take a couple of years to complete this. Mm -hmm. But I think if we manage to do that, and I hope we will, and um, we are about to launch the site very soon, towards the end of this year, mm -hmm. um, so then there will be introductions to the genre, a couple of editions sure. will be out there, many photos will be available. So if we manage to continue that, I think that uh, this will become an important resource for anyone interested in intellectual history. So anyone will be able to access it? Uh, anyone should be able to access it, oh, yes. That's wonderful. Um, Very good. And uh, let's fast forward to today, um, and I'm wondering how the current situation in Syria and Iraq are affecting the work that, you, that you've done or will do. Yeah, of course, I mean, for archaeologists and even more so for ancient Near Eastern archaeologists, the situation in Iraq, essentially since the Iran-Iraq war in 1980, has been catastrophic. Um, but at least until 2001, uh, 2002, it was still possible to do some kind of excavations mm -hmm. there. 
since then, this has become very difficult. And um, Do you think anything has been ruined or destroyed? Yes, and yes. at the same time, of course, what we have seen happening uh, was that uh, illicit digging uh, increased massively. So this has led to the situation in Iraq where, where many, many important texts have appeared on the market that, came, uh, that do come from these illicit excavations conducted by local people who sell the stuff to, to, to middlemen who then sell them on to traders all over the world, whether mm -hmm. it's in the, in the Arab world or Japan or Europe or the United States. Um, this has caused kind of an ethical dilemma for um, scholars um, working on texts. Um, obviously, um, these excavations, these illicit excavations, destroy context. And it's, it's a shame, because we have the opportunity in Iraq to find ancient libraries in their entirety. We can reconstruct uh, what uh, people there actually studied, what kind of texts they read, uh, mm -hmm. by looking at the ensemble of texts. And that, of course, is no longer possible when you deal with these stolen tablets. So some archaeologists especially have argued one should not really look at these texts at all, because they do come from these illicit excavations. I have to say, though, that given the fact that there are really uh, tens of thousands of these texts flooding the markets, that wow. I think it is impossible to ignore them. Mm -hmm. And some of these texts are truly important. For instance, um, a recent publication included the first uh, law text from anywhere in the world, the laws of Aronamo, in a very well-preserved version. Mm -hmm. And it is just impossible not to, to, to study it, that right. text. So the situation in Iraq was bad enough for many decades that led most archaeologists to sort of migrate to Syria. Uh, very good work has been done since 1980 and up to uh, 2011. But when the civil war uh, broke out in Syria, of course, the situation there deteriorated as well. And right now, um, no excavations are possible in Syria either. Um, this has led archaeologists to migrate to Kurdistan now, which is the only region sort of in the central, in the core area of Mesopotamia where you can still excavate. And uh, archaeologists are also excavating in, um, in Turkey. Mm -hmm. um, with ISIS taking over um, power in this region, the situation has probably become even worse. Right. Um, because now ISIS um, also actively destroys um, finds that are being made, especially when these are um, visual things, statues or so, which are deemed uh, pagan and therefore mm -hmm. um, in, in, the, right. in the view of these people should not be out there. So some months ago, ISIS posted um, a number of photos of a destruction of a statue found in Tel Ajaja in eastern Syria on the Khabur River. Uh, this is the uh, ancient city of Shadikani, a statue apparently of an Assyrian king with uh, what seems to be a very interesting inscription. I've tried to decipher it, and you can read a number of lines quite well. And the text deals with the Persians and uh, a campaign against the West and is, uh, provides information on the local cults in, uh, Durk, um, in, in, in Shadikani. It is a very interesting and important text, but the photos, of course, are poor. The statue has been destroyed. so. Um, the situation is, of course, deeply frustrating. Right. But it is important, I think, um, right now uh, to intensify, actually, our, our uh, endeavors to deal with the material, to make sure that uh, we, we keep track of what is coming out. Mm -hmm. As I said, I mean, it will be hundreds, tens of thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands of texts that will eventually be show up somewhere um, on the market in private collections or wherever. And, and I do believe we have to somehow publish these texts. Right. Um, despite the fact that the way they were found is, is very regrettable. Right. Well, this has been fascinating. Thank you so much for being here today with us and sharing some of your work. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to, to have an opportunity to do so. OK. For more information about Professor Fromm and his work, please visit our website at yale.edu slash Macmillan Report. Be sure to join us again for another episode of the Macmillan Report, made possible through funding from the Whitney and Betty Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale.